can you run when you don't know the way of the Spirit? Oak House Church brings to you the word of life which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen, and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter His Word. God bless you. The Lord, let it fall upon us as a blanket today. Thank you. That today it will not be the Word alone that will go for, but the Spirit, the Bible says, the Word that I speak to you, they are Spirit and they are life. Thank you, Father. We receive your Word and bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We may be seated quietly in the presence of the Lord. You're welcome to church this morning. We're grateful to the Lord for having kept us and brought us again today. Hallelujah. How many of us are grateful to the Lord for today? I am. I am. For so many things, I am grateful to the Lord. Today, we're going to be looking into the Word of God and we're going to be discussing a concept that is a recurring theme in the scripture. You know what a recurring theme is? A recurring theme is something that, you know, is constant. It's something that the Bible talks about. It is actually a theme in the scripture, and the Bible talks about it often. It's a recurring theme, especially in the New Testament. However, this particular concept is not a, in a, You would hardly see it talked about in the church. People hardly talk about it. It is amazing how many times Jesus constantly emphasized this concept. It is amazing how many times Paul, the apostle, constantly emphasized this particular concept. Yet, we hardly talk about it. We hardly refer to it at all in the scripture. We're going to take a look at it and trust God to open up a dimension of him. And what concept am I talking about? It is a concept of being worthy of the kingdom of God. Throughout the scripture, you see Apostle Paul. I'm going to look at several examples. And you see Jesus. There were the two forerunners and the one that were pushing this concept of being worthy of the kingdom of heaven or worthy of the kingdom of God. The big question is, are you worthy of the kingdom? Because the impression that we have... I don't know whether impression can maybe because of the preaching or whatever it is. The impression that we have is that God is sitting in heaven, he's anxious, he's shaking his hand and saying, Oh God, I hope these people will accept the message. Oh, I really hope they'll accept the message. If that is the only concept you have of God and the kingdom and heaven and, and eternity, what would happen to you? What you would have observed is that you're going to be doing three days on in God, one day off, five days on. 29 days off, you're going to have a topsy-topsy Christianity because of the kind of impression that you think that heaven has or the kind of impression that you have of God and things that have to do with eternity. So any slight pressure, you move back. Any slight pressure, you stop. I've seen people say, I'm not serving God again or whatever it is. Or even when they don't verbalize that they're not serving God again, their actions say so, their hearts say so, the kind of things that they do. So you have a lot of up and down Christianity and so very little growth. 20 years in love, 15 years, but very little growth. The question is why? It is because of the concept that we have of God. Maybe he's there say, hey, God, do oh, ah, please let this person come to heaven. Oh God, I hope this person will listen to my message. That is one side of the picture. Jesus, being aware of this, gave us a balanced side of the scripture. Let's go to the Bible. Let's look at, um, let's take a look at Jesus' view first of all. Luke chapter 20. Jesus was trying to say, this age is about to come to an end. However, there are many that are not qualified to step into the next age. There are many that are not fit for the next age. If we read the story in Luke chapter 20 verse 34, Jesus replied, Jesus answered to them, the sons of this age, they marry and are given in marriage. I'm reading from Luke 20 verse 34. Let's look at 35. It's about those who are counted worthy to attain that age. What does that tell you? There are many that are not counted worthy of the next age. They are not fit for the next age with the Lord. He said those that are counted worthy for that age, the Bible says in that time, they are not going to marry, they are not going to give in marriage and all of that. But you see, the primary thing you take away from there is that Jesus is telling us that there are people that are not qualified to step into the next age with him. Let's take a look, look at another scripture. Luke chapter 9 verse 62. So the Bible says, and Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand on the plow 
that this person is serving the Lord, working for the Lord, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Not everyone is fit for the kingdom. Let's use another adjective. Not everyone is qualified for the kingdom. I used to think every single person is qualified for the kingdom because Jesus has released his blood and X, Y, Z. But it's very clear. And all these ones I'm reading are from the very lips of Jesus. For those who argue and say, well, certain parts of the scripture, uh, it was Apostle Paul that said it. And Apostle Paul doesn't really know what he's talking about. So I'm, I want to first of all look at the things that Jesus said concerning being fit for the kingdom. And you see how many times he said, I can't even read all the scriptures that Jesus was referring to the same thing. He said, if you put your hand on the plow and you look back, he said, you are not fit for the kingdom. And the thing is, even look back from what? So I'm going to give an example. Please, sir, come. Let me show you. Because in your mind, you feel, okay, if, if I, I put my hand, put your hand on the plow. You're, I mean, this is the plow. So you need to be looking at me as you put the plow. Now, I'm the, so you're putting your hand on the plow. Okay. So his hand is on the plow and you look back. Look back. Did you see that his hand... Oh, guy, your own backsliding. God forbid. This is intense. Most people put their hand on the plow and then they look back. The Bible didn't tell us that they removed their hand from the plow. They only said they put their hand on the plow, but they looked away. They looked back, but their hand was still on the plow. So they were still in service. But like Lord's wife, they looked back. They looked back. They were no more on the assignment. They were no more pursuing Jesus with everything. The Bible said their hands were on the plow. They were ushered. They were in the choir. They were whatever it is. But the Bible said they looked back. They turned away from Jesus. The Bible said the moment a person does that, he's not fit. Please sit. He is not qualified for the kingdom of heaven. That you go born again, you are in the kingdom of God, you are serving. The Bible said there are still people who are not fit for the kingdom of God. Let's take a look at another one just in case one is saying, ah, how can Luke 21 verse 36 watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worth worthy to escape again you see that concept of being counted worthy counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the son of man so there are people and listen to who was jesus talking to he was talking to his disciples he said he was talking to them directly he said, what therefore and pray always that you, he wasn't talking about the world, he wasn't talking about unbelievers. He said that you be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of God. Meaning that there are people that though they are in the kingdom doing whatever it is they are doing, the Bible says if you don't pray, if you don't take certain steps, you will not be counted worthy to escape, number one. Number two, you will not be counted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. Not everybody will be counted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. Just in case you think, oh, don't worry, we can do whatever we like and we are counted. No. There is a counting word. You know what Apostle Paul said? Hey, I do all these things because I want to win Christ. I've always wondered, what are, you, or what are you winning again in Christ? Jesus has already won you. Christ has won you. So why is Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 saying again that I want to win Christ? Or put, it, put in another way in that Philippians chapter 3. He said, I want to be counted worthy of Christ. What's he talking about? Maybe I should look at one more scripture in Luke chapter. Uh, okay, let's take a look. Let's do some work in Matthew 10. Matthew 10, 37 and 38. Let's see what the scripture has there. I think I'll read that one and then we'll go over to the things that uh, Apostle Paul said. That's Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Okay. So he said, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Verse 38, he continues by saying, And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So if your Christianity does not include taking up the cross, though you are in church, you are not counted worthy. Though you are in church, you are not counted qualified. Though you are giving your life to Christ, you are not counted qualified. Scripture, Jesus Christ, not another person. He said, and then when you now take up your cross, then you're going to follow after me. He said, if you do not do that, the Bible says, you are not worthy of me. Scripture, Bible. Let's move further into the New Testament. I'm going to read the ones from Apostle Paul. Reason being that some people say, well, some people argue foolishly and they say, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not the New Testament because Jesus hadn't yet died. So let's do some work now in the New Testament. Let's take a look at what Apostle Paul said, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. 
he said, and this is the evidence. Okay, let me read it. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which also you must suffer. He was talking to Christians. He said, for so that you, Christian, will be counted worthy. Now, reading the scriptures is telling me that coming to the altar to give my life to Christ is not enough. It's not enough. Because for whatever reason, that is how we are. The moment somebody gives his life to Christ, well, Jesus entered the person's life on the altar. The person feels, okay, yeah, buy in the sweet, buy and buy. I'm going to make it. The Bible says, no, you still have something to do to be counted worthy. And we're going to understand what it means to be worthy. Okay, let's look do another walk in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. So you see that's why I said it's a recurring theme. I can read scripture after scripture after scripture. Let's look uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. He said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech. What does beseech mean? What does besiege? Say again. Beg is light. Urge. Urge you. Another word. Um, like pressure beg not begging is light kind of like compel plead cry I beseech you I force you he said that you walk worthy of the vocation where which you are called let's look at it in another translation maybe we'll have NLT or any other one in case someone doesn't understand what vocation is we'll just take a look at that scripture okay therefore I a prisoner for serving the Lord. So the reason this man was a prisoner is because he served the Lord. He said, beg you. Be and it's not like begging as in, oh, uh, sister, sister Juliet, I can, can you give me five covers? No, no, no. He's, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling you have received. In other words, there is a way to live your life worthy of the call you have received. You have not received a call to be a pastor, a deacon, a choir, whatever, music minister, or whatever it is you are doing, and you live anyhow. The Bible says, no, you have to live a life that is worthy of that call. Okay, I think the point is made, but maybe I should just read one more. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10. It says, and we pray this in order. So Paul was making a certain prayer for the Colossian Christian, the Christians in Colossae and he said the reason I'm praying this is so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord there is a life worthy of the Lord, there are certain things that if you do not do, the Bible says you are not qualified you are not worthy, you are not fit for the kingdom, you are not fit for the next age not everybody that went to school is fit for a job at MTN not everyone that went to school is fit for a job at the United Nations. Not everybody that has a degree in uh, mathematics is fit to be a math teacher. There are other things they're going to take a look at. Now that person will be foolish to assume because I have a degree in math, that means I'm going to get the job. That is exactly how youths behave. They just assume because I've gone to school, I am qualified to get a job. No, there is a lot more. So the big question is, what does it mean to be worthy of the kingdom? What does it mean to be qualified? Actually, there are many things that it means. As you even read the scripture, you begin to pick out those things that makes a man worthy or fit for the kingdom of God. But I'll put it in one capsule. It is living a life that is consistent to the character of Christ. Meaning, you cannot live your entire life here on earth honoring Satan and expect to go to heaven. You can't live your life here on earth doing whatever you like, not advancing the kingdom, living a life that is opposite the kingdom, disobeying the word of God, and expect that you are fit for the kingdom. Almost everybody here, I believe, has a social media page, and then you wonder when it is their birthday. They'll take a picture, put it, and be saying happy birthday to me. And I always wonder those people, if I have the time I go through their pictures, you will never see one thing promoting Jesus Christ. You will never, want to, you will never see one thing advancing the cost of the kingdom. But they will advance the cost of their career. They will go for training for their career and do all of that. You think you finish living life that way, dishonoring God, disobeying God, you think you would finish desecrating the word of God. You will be the number one person that will attack pastors. When other people are criticizing the body of Christ, you put your mouth there. Whether it's on social media or in a small garden, you put your mouth, you finish doing it and you are qualified for the same kingdom you are destroying. The Bible says, tell it not in God. Publish it not in Eshkelon. When Saul died, 
David made sure that the person that brought that message, his head went. You are the same one in your family. You get home. Hey, you don't know what my pastor said today. You don't know what this person did to me today. You, your mouth, you with the same mouth, you are destroying the kingdom. And you want to go to that same kingdom that you are destroying. You do not advance the kingdom. You don't care about the kingdom. Your money doesn't go into the advancement of the kingdom. Your service doesn't go. And you want to go to that same kingdom. How are you planning to do that? You have never suffered for the kingdom. See what the Bible says. It was telling the Tosilina Christian. He said because you are suffering. You are being counted worthy. You pay more attention to your physical boss. You pay more attention to your business. You pay more attention to everything else. Apart from it. You allow the kingdom to fall in your hand. An assignment is given to you. And it slips through your hand. And yet you want to go to that same kingdom. How do you plan? The Bible says you are not fit. You can't. One day I had to ask the Lord. Hey Lord this heaven. Don't you think that these things are a bit intense? Why can't you just give our life to Christ and then we are qualified for heaven? He said, ordinary your asso rock. Can you walk in there anyhow? Just physical asso rock. Your bre- do you walk in there anyhow? The answer is no. Why do you think coming to heaven will be easier? He said, the road is narrow. It's something that you can't combine seeking the Lord and seeking anything else. That's why he said, the only time you will find me is if you seek me with all of your heart. You can't give God half attention and expect to find him. You can't. You can't give God half attention and expect to be qualified for the kingdom. If you do a study on all those scriptures I mentioned, you begin to pick out the things. One of them he said to us in Luke, he said that if you do not take up your cross, what does it mean to take up your cross? This is what I'm going to pay. The price I'm paying for my commitment to, for my commitment to Jesus. Sometimes it may mean the loss of your job. I went to preach in Asaba. One lady during the question and answer session on the Saturday morning, one lady came out and she said that a uh, pastor in her job, she has to tell a lot of lies on a daily basis. She's lying from morning till evening. On top of that, the job doesn't even give her time to come to church. I, didn't, I said, so the question is, she said, I'm thinking if I should um, resign when I get under. I said, you don't understand. The job is a shovel you're using to dig your grave. And you are still asking whether you should wait until you get another job. Resign now, today. It is a cross you have to carry. You will go without a job for days, for weeks, for months. You will be insulted. You will be abused. There are some things you cannot wear. There are some things you cannot do. There are many things you are going to sacrifice. He said, you're going to take up your cross. If I ask you now, what cross are you carrying? For your commitment to Jesus. What is the cross? What have you let go of because of your work with Jesus? What have you let go of? Oh, you don't have a cross and you are planning to go to the kingdom? You are joking. Paul said, in my body, look at the marks of Christ. Where are your marks? Where are your marks of Christ? If they are non-existent, Jesus was very clear. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let me explain something to you. The Lord was teaching me, said, you know, a lot of times you verbalize things. Those things are not the answer. Those things are the intention. How do you put it now? Uh, inten- uh, something of intent. Um, expression of intent. Let me explain. You know how we say, oh God, I want to serve you. We think that that thing we are saying means that we, now, we are now going to serve God. Mm, God said it is an expression of intent. It is not what you do after that determines whether or not you want to serve me or not. So the scripture that I read in Luke where he said, if anybody desires to come after me, you know in worship say, oh God, I desire God. Uh-huh. You have stated intent. It is what you now do. He said, now that you have desire to come after me, step one, you are going to deny yourself. Meaning it's no more about you. It has never been about you. You are going to count yourself as not important in the equation. It's not about you like it, you don't like it. It's not, ah, pastor, my church is far. My grandmother said, my uncle said, my boss said. The Bible said you are going to deny yourself. The more you deny yourself, the more qualified you are for the kingdom. What have you denied in your pursuit of God? If you can't write it down, you want to think again about your Christianity and whether you are really fit. You want to think about it again. Issues of eternity are not to be taken lightly. Issues of the coming age are not to be taken lightly because the moment your days are over, the Bible says in the book of Job that there is a limit given to every man. He said you can't exceed it. The moment the chapter closes, the 
that's the end. It's over. It's final. You can't take the issues of eternity or the things that Jesus said around those lines casually. He said, so if you want to follow me, he said, then you're going to deny yourself. Then you are going to take that your cross before you discuss following Jesus. Following Jesus is step three. If you are following Jesus, yet you have not denied yourself and you have not taken up your cross, what does that mean? It means you are not following Jesus. You're following somebody else. You're not following Jesus. Because following Jesus is step three. Step one is what? You deny yourself. Step two, you take up your cross. Step three, you follow him. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. You know, as simple as that song is, if you turn back, Jesus said, you are no more fit. You are no more fit. If I were you, I would sit down and ask myself, these things that the scripture has said, where do I fall in in this thing? Now, in pursuing being fit for the kingdom, there are actually two things that will determine how much you pursue being fit. Because you see what happens to a lot of us. We start the journey for one week or maybe even a month. Somewhere along the line, we'll drop it. I was teaching some people about learning to stretch in prayer, stay long in prayer. And somebody um, made a comment that was very true. She said, it's not about sitting six hours in prayer or whatever. She said, it's good. She said, but the problem is consistency in doing it. And that's the truth. Let me tell you why people are not consistent in their work with God. They are not consistent in pursuing after God. They are not consistent in the things that they do for the Lord. Today they'll do, you see many people, they'll be on fire for God. They'll do it today, tomorrow, next. After some time, they'll run out of steam. You start looking for them. The same person that was on fire. The same person that was driving down at the department. The same person that was going up and now preaching. After some time, he loses interest. By the time you ask him again, he doesn't even know that there's anything called soul winning. He doesn't even know there's anything called prayer. There are two things that will determine, number one, how long or how consistent you are going to pursue God. And if you are going to pursue God without eye service, because if you look at your life, you see most of the pursuit of God you are doing is full of eye service. But I'm going to tell you how to eliminate that from your life. Let me tell you what is the missing link. There are two of them. I'm going to quickly discuss them and then we'll trust the spirit of God to do a work in our lives. The first thing that will determine how long or how earnestly you are going to pursue this thing. And you find out that the people that had this con concept or this disposition of the heart, they are the ones that follow God consistently. They are the one. anybody, when I mention this to you, see, anybody who knows these two things, they are the ones that serve God the highest and the most. They are the ones that pay the biggest price. They are the most consistent of all. You know what number one is? It is the knowledge of the reward system of heaven. I'll explain it. The, no, no, sorry that I use the word knowledge. Knowledge is not it. The revelation. Because revelation is deeper than knowledge. When you have a revelation of the reward system of God, you are not going to play with God at all. So I sat down and I observed footballers. And they will say Messi is the, I think he's the second best player. Ronaldo I think is number three. Okay, good. So I started watching them when they play. I was looking at their legs and their feet. I found out their feet is exactly the same as the other people. Their legs are exactly the same as the other people. They are not differently positioned. It's not like when God made the leg of Ronaldo. He was, maybe he had three legs or one leg twisted. Am I correct? So are we saying that his legs are exactly the same as Zeno's legs, right? Correct? Okay. Why is Ronaldo the best player in the world? Who plays football here? Why is Pastor Yakubu not known even among us here as a good footballer? Who is the best player in Nigeria? Oh, you see, we don't even know. Who is he? Philip Osondu. Who knows? Okay, sorry, sir. Sorry that we don't really know your name. But that whoever he, he is, why is he not better than Ronaldo and Messi and Drogba and all those, all Drogba and all those guys? Why? They have the same legs. What is the difference? So I began to study their routine. Ronaldo, I'm told, the first thing when I began to study, they said, number one, he's not a fan of the eight-hour sleep that everybody is after. 
That's number one. Now number two, he spent personal training, not the one they do for the group. He spends minimum of three hours personal exercise, not the one they do for the group. As a human being, he loves pizza, right? But he doesn't eat it. He will see it, his body will be shaking. He can't eat it. He was asked why. He said, I have to be in shape. Why is he doing that? The other guy, Messi, spends five hours in training every day. Magic Johnson spends how many hours? I think four hours every day. And then he runs every single day. Five, uh, five miles to his office every day. Why are they doing it? They know what they are going to get. They understand the price. They know the reward. So when uh, this guy looks at pizza, he says, I can't mess up my body. I can't clog my system. I need my body functioning at par. Why? I understand the reward. Unfortunately, Christians don't understand the reward. They don't know God's reward system. They know the reward system of United Nations. So everybody struggling to work for United Nations. Aren't you blind? If you have a revelation of how God rewards, you won't do like this. You won't be like this. We don't know it. We do not have a revelation of the reward system. I was told about two brothers. Two of them. They, they were told by God that they should go to um, France to one preach. They couldn't travel. They tried to travel. They couldn't travel. Do you know what these boys did? They now went to a slave master that they knew normally trades between Nigeria and France. Right? They went to him. They said, come and buy us as slaves. Why? No, we just want to be bought as slaves. They sold themselves as slaves because they wanted to go to France to preach. They gave them the money. They gave it to charity. They entered as slaves bound on a boat. They went to France to preach. If it's some of us who say, eh, if it's important to God, he should give us a vision, should make it easy for us. Why did they do that? They understand the reward system. That is why Paul said, <laughs> Paul said, I labor more than you all. I labor. That's why Paul was writing in Hebrews chapter 6. He said, God will never forget your labor of love. He understood the reward system. That is why nobody in the Bible is more talked about than Apostle Paul. Why? He labored. He understood the reward system. If God will give you a revelation of the reward system, listen, whatever it is you're doing for God, you go and resign. No kingdom on earth, no kingdom after the earth rewards more than God. None. Not one. Not one. It doesn't matter the price you pay to advance this kingdom. It's more than worth it. It is when we go to the other side, you will find out. And I began to cry, say, God, give me a revelation of your reward system. Because even me, I don't have it. If I do, I won't be like this. I was sharing with some people in, uh, I went for one of my mentee's wedding. They were doing something that, you know, you're a bad thing. They were speaking and all of that. And I was sharing with them. I said, even me, I don't understand the reward system. They said, ah, Rev, we thought you've accomplished. I said, I don't. Because if I do, I'd have gone to that stage, interrupted them and said, excuse me, can I have five minutes of your time? Do you think they will listen? They will say, okay. Because they want to know what, what is the thing, right? And the person doing it went in there not say, ah, Rev, keep quiet. Then I would have gone there and said, listen. All of you, if you are not saved, blah, 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 blah. It's because I don't understand it. What's it? That's why I'm sitting out here. If I did, that's all I've done. I said, because Apostle Paul, one time they arrested him. They're going to throw him in jail. In fact, he was preaching and they were stoning him and all of that. The uproar became a lot. And you know what he did? He now, the, the, the governor, whatever, called and they arrested Apostle Paul to take him inside. Paul said, excuse me, I have something to say. I have something to say. So the first time I read it, my thought process was Paul will now start defending himself. Guess what? When Paul opened his mouth to speak, Paul said, brethren, some days ago, you crucified a man called Jesus. Da, 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 da. He began to preach again. Why? Paul said, let me add one small crown again today. Let me add a small badge today. Let me do something else so that I am fit for the kingdom of heaven. Because he understood the reward system. You don't understand the reward system. That's why you're playing with your work with God. And then, you are playing with your work with God. You are not advancing the same kingdom that you want to go to. How? If you don't have a part in it, you are not going there. If you don't have a part in it when you are in time, you will not have a part in it when you are in eternity. How do I know? Jesus called the feast. Or Jesus was saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who prepared a, a wedding banquet for his friends. And so he told his servants, go into the street and go and call people. And what happened? The Bible said that those people, they refused to come. 
and the king sent them again say go go and talk to them about coming the bible says one went to his field the other went to his business and the king said i've invited them to come but they are not worthy they are not worthy they are not worthy why did jesus say they are not worthy the reason is simple they did not advance the kingdom in time they did not commit to the kingdom in time they had no stake in the kingdom in time they are not going to have it in eternity and i observed something the bible said one went to his field the other went to his business is there a problem with the field no is there a problem with the business no legitimate reasons why people ignore the call for the marriage feast and jesus said because of that he said the people i told to come they are not qualified he said now go and bring another set of people and then they went and brought people in and jesus said there are people that i'm inviting every day they are not worthy they are not worthy at all so i'm asking myself how fit am i for the kingdom i told you there's one and i told you that there's a second one that would help you to be able to because the moment you understand the reward system <laughs> do you know wh wh what's the best paying organization in the whole world who knows what it is who knows okay let's assume it's united nations right the highest they can give you is money. Correct? Is there anything after that? Money. The highest they can give you is what again? A house. The best they can do is build a stadium with your name on it. That's the best and that's it. They finish giving you that thing. You close your eyes in debt. It ends there. Even those your clothes. Hmm? The best, for instance, if you're a military man, when they are burying you, they'll do you 21 gun salute. They fold your uniform put it on your casket, oh, a great soldier is gone. Then they'll shoot 21 salute for you and everybody will be sad. That's the end. But the reward they give in heaven, eh? let's not discuss the crown. Let's not discuss the honor. Somebody had a vision, he went to heaven and when he went to heaven, he saw the marriage feast had been prepared and all of that and he saw one particular seat well decorated. He had the vision. was really, really decorated and all of that and so he asked the angel that was showing him around. He said, is this place, ah, this particular place is more decorated than any other place? And they said, yes, this place is for brother Paul. They don't call him Apostle Paul. It's you and I call him Apostle Paul. He said, it's for brother Paul. He said, why? He said, no other person suffered for the kingdom more than Apostle Paul. No other person. No other person. And so his reward is harder than any other person. Do you know that you and I are some of our ancestors were born on the stake for this gospel? They were put. They were born. Some were thrown into the lion's den. Are we going to the same heaven with these people? Do you think that God is unfair and unjust? You just because somebody insulted you, you get angry, you will not even come to church. Someone told me that she's not coming to church because somebody annoyed her in the church. Or somebody annoyed him in the church. He was a man. He said he's not coming because somebody annoyed him. I said, wait, did that person die for you? No. So when you stand before Jesus, you're going to tell him the reason why you didn't come to church. I can't even repeat this sentence. Can you, can't you see how you are even sounding? Are you alright? Because we are blind to the reward system of it. We think we are doing it for Pastor Fred. We think we are doing it for church. You think we are doing it for Pastor whoever in your department. You think that's what you are doing. You think the reward is here. God rewards in time and rewards in eternity. Nobody can outgive God. Nobody. Nobody. Nobody can outgive God. Nobody can reward more than God. If you have a revelation of the reward system when you come to church, you are coming by six. And it's not that you're coming to be looking around. You're coming to say, what can I do? What can I do for God? Because you know, for every labor is adding to your reward. For everything you drop is adding to your reward in heaven. It's making you worthy. But when today, you are there, next tomorrow, you give one billion excuses why you will not be committed. Why you will not do what you're supposed to do. Or you are doing all of that for Caesar. You see that Caesar you are serving. Eh? You will serve him in time and you will serve him in eternity. You see that your Caesar, you must serve him. Because you cannot give your time to Caesar on, in time and then expect to get a reward in eternity. You are joking. So you are not worthy. January, this is May. If they call your report card now, what will be written there? Things that have way to, not funny, funny things. Things of eternal value. How has your life counted for this kingdom? How have you pushed it forward? How have you gone without food and water? How have you trekked? What have you done to move it forward? 
but yet you are the one that demands the most from this same kingdom that you are destroying you are the one demanding the most but you are giving the least commitment the least time you are the biggest gossip the one with the biggest man is and you want to go there the bible says you are not fit will you make mistakes yes but god will recognize the difference between a mistake and a lifestyle God recognizes the difference. He knows when it is a mistake. He knows when it's a lifestyle. Somebody can say something that is not true as a mistake. Another person says it as a lifestyle. Somebody can slander as a mistake. Somebody can do it as a lifestyle. If it is your lifestyle, you are not fit. Do you get the difference? And guess who knows? God knows. Let's quickly take a look at the second reason. Or the second thing that will determine um, how far you go with in your pursuit for God. We're going to ask God, give me a revelation, Lord, of the reward system. Because I don't have it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. Help me to know, help me to know it. The second thing is the spirit of urgency. The spirit of urgency. You see, this is what characterizes the early church. They understood the urgency. So there are people that know, okay, God is going to reward but let's next year, next month, 15 years time, three days later, tomorrow. And that was why you are not worthy if you are postponing it. Do you know how I know you are not worthy? Because Matthew 25, if you study the story of the virgins. Now, if you analyze Matthew 25 from verse 1 to 11, you find something about the virgins. They, their plan in verse 1 was to get up. The Bible said, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. So, their thought, process was, their thought process was to get up and go and meet the bridegroom, correct? They wanted to go to heaven. So, what was the problem? Everything about the wise were exactly like the foolish. Every single thing. The Bible said, there was a time they all slumbered. There was a time they all slept. There was a time everything was the same. One difference was that the wise virgin had extra oil the foolish virgins had oil so they were anointed just like the foolish the, the wise of God were anointed what was the difference? verse 10 tells us what the difference was let's look at it uh, Matthew 25 I think verse 10 okay good while they went to buy what are they going to buy? oil now this scripture is telling me that the foolish virgins desired oil it's not that they didn't desire they desired oil number one number two they knew where to buy oil so what was the problem that made them unfit for the kingdom? The Bible says, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those that were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. What was the problem with the foolish virgins? Timing. Procrastination. They didn't have a sense of urgency. They thought, I will buy oil tomorrow. I will serve God next week. I will do it next year. I will do it two million years later. They didn't have a sense of urgency. If you read Apostle Paul, Peter, this guy, this guy, when you read them, you think Jesus is coming that afternoon. They had a sense of urgency. They knew there was no time. They were right. They were living as if Jesus is coming anytime, any moment. Let me tell you something. Eh? There's something about life. There's something about death. There are three things that characterize them. Number one is that these two things I've mentioned, rapture and death, because that's how you transit, right? These two, they are imminent and they are also unpredictable. They are imminent and they are unpredictable. Now there is a, a website <laughs> that I saw. Somebody mentioned it, so I went and checked that website. That website tells you the day you are going to die. <laughs> so it works with certain algorithms. So you put in your data, you put in date of birth, you put in just a few details, your height, your weight, your country, your age, da da da. It will ca calculate and tell you the day you are going to die. So Billy Graham, I had put his own date. They gave him his date. He lived more than 20 years after the day they predicted. Some, they put it, they died 15 years before the day they predicted. So I put in my data. I gave them dates, the birth, this, that, where I'm living, my gender, da, da, da. When I feel, do you know when they say I'm going to, do you know when they say I'm going to die? They say when I'm 63 years, 63 years, I think uh, nine months. When I'm 63 years, nine months and zero days, that's when I'm going to die. So the following day, I put in the same information. They ask, I'm going to die when I'm, is it 54? These same people, they, yesterday I'm 60, I'm going to die, now I'm 54. The point is this, no matter how versed the scientific calculation is, death is unpredictable. 
Doctors will say you, you have five days to live. You find the person dying the next day. Doctors will say you have 10 years to live. You find the person living for 20 years. Death is unpredictable. Rapture is unpredictable. And it is eminent. You know what it means to be eminent? It's happening any minute from now. I had a vision of the one day. I was praying, 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 praying. And then all of a sudden, I found myself, Jesus was in the sky. I didn't see him, but he was talking to me. And the sky became like a notebook. Kind of like what happened to John. So he began to write in the sky. The sky became like, and he began to write. The first word that left his mouth, and it's not a vocabulary, it's not my language, it's not something I would normally say. Uh, eminent. I've never, I don't know that I use imminent. I don't know that I use that word. But he said, My return is imminent. That's what he said. He said, My return is imminent. That is, Jesus, stop telling people that Jesus is coming soon. I'm going to tell you why I've said so. Don't say he's coming soon. Do you know why? When you say he's coming soon, it gives the impression that one day he will come. One day he will come. So because we keep saying Jesus is coming soon, soon meaning he's around the corner, but it's one day. Now, when you when that happens, yeah, so people say, okay, mm, he's coming soon. But let me tell you what it is. So they wait for some time, five years, six years, seven years, nine years, they don't see the Jesus, the backslide. Or they wait for at least one year or six months. Like I remember during the pandemic, people were serious with God. When rapture did not occur, everybody went back to start to school. That time people were telling me, Rev, you need to do prophetic morning every day. You need to do da, 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 da. When it dawned on them that it's like this, Jesus is not coming soon. They say this man is no more as relevant as we thought. We thought that, she, 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 that Jesus is coming today. So we'll hold our leg knowing that Jesus is coming. But let me tell you when Jesus is coming. I can pinpoint the exact date he's coming. Do you know when he's coming? Anytime. Not soon. Anytime. It's different from saying Jesus is coming soon. You need to say Jesus is coming anytime. Meaning he can come now. He can come in 20 years time. He can come in 15 years time. He makes it real to you. He can come at any time. And so there is a sense of urgency. We need to do whatever we need to do now. Quickly he's coming. The, the, the Bible ended by saying, Jesus come Maranatha come. He's anytime. He's showing up in the mission field. He's appearing to Muslims. He's appearing to Buddhists. Look at what was going on in India. All their gods failed them and they had to you know what? People are busy sharing that video. They are not smart. It's not to be sharing video. It's to now pray. Lord, because what has happened is that God has opened the door for the gospel. What we need to do because we are fond of circulating videos. And stop sending me all those videos. What has God done? It is sent. There's something I've done to the gods. Now go on your knees and begin to pray for revival. Oh, pray for doors open. It is now time for missionaries to invade India. Because Satan is not bound forever. If Satan is bound forever, all the ones you bound, they'll be bound forever. He's bound for a few days. So this thing that has happened, what's the video? In case some people don't know. Okay, so I think the video says that they were looking at gods or whatever and they couldn't solve their coronavirus problem. Correct? So they started destroying it. Hey, what's the solution? So as you send the video and now know that the gods are destroyed, uh -huh, it is to make strategic efforts. India is now the mission field. They are looking for the truth of the gospel. We are supposed to say, how do we begin to pray for India? What God has done, created an open door. It's now time for missionaries to flood the place with the gospel. Because that open door they have will not last long. The enemy will strategize and come back. Jesus' return is imminent. Do you know how back when they are in India? I went to India to preach maybe three years or four years ago. I can't remember. I went to one community. And when I got there, people were there screaming. They were speaking their language. So I was asking my and they were agitated. I was asking my interpreter, what's going on? He said, they say, who are you? Because you look strange to them. I said, am I strange? They said, they can tell you're not an European. I now told them you're an African. They say, it's a lie. This is not how Africans look. So you are in between. You are not an American. And they are very sure you're not an African. I said, okay, whatever I am, we brought the gospel. They were like, we came talk about Jesus. They say, who? Who are you talking? Which Jesus? Who, who? Then you now start from the beginning to start explaining that. And you know, what do you, Jesus is son of God. And really, how do you know? How do you know? The Bible says, which Bible? So I said, Father, there has to be a demonstration of your power in this place. He said, bring them to the hall, one place like that. I said, Father, <laughs> You have to show up. This is not a matter of the Holy Ghost said the Bible, Luke chapter 2, verse 15. They don't believe the Bible. 
Hindus. And that day, Jesus glorified himself as all sorts of miracle signs and wonders occurred right before the eye. And I was glad it was their own people it was happening to. So you won't say I brought somebody from Nigeria. It's their own people. God was healing legs. All sorts of things were going on. That's the kind of thing we want to see again. Not to be sending video. It's only for a while. Jesus has given that nation an opportunity. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do? Jesus is coming anytime. There is a sense of urgency in the spirit. There is a sense of urgency. I said, Lord, let that sense of urgency, let the sense of urgency of heaven, let it line up with my own sense of urgency because even I don't even have it. Because if I did, I would not be like this. I will not be like this. I don't know how urgent it is. I don't. I think I do. I don't. I don't. I don't. Give me the sense of urgency that Jesus has. Give me a sense of urgency. You will put your life in order. You will do something to advance the church. Listen, many of you are going to hell because you have not done anything for souls. Your money is in the bank. Bring it out and push the gospel. How much did you spend on tracks? Your money did not enter it. And you are going to that kingdom. You are joking. Men who have understood it, they sell cars. They sell land. That's the early church. The Bible said they were selling lands. They had a sense of urgency. They knew the reward. Peter said, Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. What is in it for us? What Peter was saying is, ha, Jesus, all this service we are giving you, what is the reward? And Jesus said, if any man leaves father, mother, brother, sister, for my sake and for the gospel, there is a living of everything for the gospel. There is a living of everything for Jesus. You have not left anything for Jesus and you are going to that kingdom. You are joking. You did not contribute in my house. Then you want to live in my house. How? You did not honor me in time. You want me to honor you in eternity. First uh, Samuel 2.30 says, far be it from me. If I don't honor them, that honor me. You don't honor God in time with your service. You don't honor God in time with your character. Do you know that when you go and disgrace God in the public, hmm, what you have done is you are dishonoring God. He said, when you dishonor me, I will lightly esteem you. There are men who have burnt their life. They burnt, burnt everything. They look like mad people. You know, in the early, in the, in the early 70s, when you give your life to Christ, what would they call you? What would they call you? As you, but there's one other they attach. They say you're a fanatic. They say you're a madman. Until they call you a mad person. Eh? Believe me when I say you have not started. You, the, 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 the unbelievers cannot be seeing you as sin. And heaven will see you as sin. No. You'll be crazy. One day, Pastor Mazino told us something. He said... That it, it, I thought it was a bit weird, but I mean, he said he, where he was loving the Lord in the car, he was worshipping and doing all of that, and he was so lost in the worship, he entered the bank, you know how he was so enraptured in love of God, he went on the, when he got into the bank, he didn't even know what he was doing, he rolled on the ground, I was saying, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I love you, he wasn't doing it to show up, he just didn't know when that fullness of his heart came out to be, people will call you mad, you go to the street, you preach, you're in the bus, you're in the classroom, you're on shame flying. Anytime somebody calls you, it's all about Jesus. They have to, your family has to call you for a meeting and say, hey, come sit down. I remember my grandmother saying that you have, honestly, she called my parents and said that this is your daughter that you people sent to university. She has gone mad. She's, it's confirmed. She's mad. Confirmed. There's no whatever. My father can say, they say you are mad. I say, really? If they say you are now preaching everywhere. I say, okay, is that the kind of man that, yes, I am mad. If that's kind of matter, yes, I am mad. Crazy, mad. For this, that's the only way to live. That's the only way. You know why we are not living that way? Jesus is interested in the quality of your life, not in the quantity of all these souls coming in. They are good and awesome, but I read in my Bible, Jesus threatened to close down four churches of the seven. He threatened to close it down. Which ones was he closing down? The ones that were not passionate. The ones that were not mad. He said, listen, you are serving, doing all of this, but I tell you something. He said, you have lost your first love, and so I'm coming to take away the candlestick. You know what? I'm coming to shut down the church. Jesus threatened to shut down four of the seven churches. Why? They had Christians that were not mad. 
He said, you are serving, but you are serving casually. You are doing all of this. You are tolerating evil casually. Jesus said, when I see casualty in you, I will shut down that system. Because you are deceiving people, making people feel that this is what it is. Do you know, on earth, many Christians, many churches have been shut down by heaven, but their, their doors are still open. In the spirit, they don't recognize those churches are in existence. Who does God shut down? If you look at the ones he shut down, he said, because you have a reputation that you are alive, but you are dead. He told the other one, he said, listen, you are serving, doing this, doing this, doing this, and all of that. He said, but you have lost your first love. You have lost your passion for God. You are doing lukewarm Christianity. It is because you are lukewarm. That is why you are not mad. It is because you are lukewarm. That is why you don't have a sense of urgency. A man of fire has a sense of urgency. He knows I can't wait till tomorrow. I can't wait till next week. And the devil had a meeting. And they said this gospel is spreading too fast. What do we do? It's spreading fast. What do we do? He called his demons and they were having a meeting. And one of them said, excuse me, master. Let's tell them there is no God. And Lucifer was angry. He got up. He said the whole creation declares his glory. Everybody knows that there is a God. He said the Christians will not be deceived by that. He said a few, a few foolish people will believe there is no God. But all oh, heaven declares the glory of God. Another one said, hmm, let's tell them that there's no hell. He said they know that, that there's consequence for every action. So you can't deceive too many of them like that. Then one that had been there, people were giving different, different, uh, whatever. Then one of them that had been at the back observing very quietly. He's called the demon of intelligence. He was observing quietly. He said, excuse me, I want to make a comment. That demon is resident in Europe. He said, I want to make a comment. And Satan said, yes, go ahead. Uh, any comment now will do. Go ahead, but make it reasonable. He said, yes. We are going to go to the whole earth. We are going to tell them there is God. Are you mad? We are trying to stop the spread of the gospel. He said, hold on, Satan. I'm coming somewhere. We are going to tell them that there is heaven. Are you crazy? That's exactly what we don't want them to know. He said, I'm coming. We are going to tell them that there is hell. He said, you, in fact, tie him and throw him into hellfire. He said, hold on. Give me one more minute. We will tell them that there is God. We'll tell them that it's heaven. We'll tell them that it's hell. But we're going to add one more thing. We're going to tell them that there's time. We're going to tell them that there's time. We're going to tell them that there's time. They can serve God tomorrow. They can be on fire when they are 16. They can be on fire when they are 40. There's always something to keep them from being on fire. Tell them it is tomorrow. Tell them next week. But never today. Never today. Today is not the time. And Satan said, wow, now I command every demon in hell, go throughout the world and begin to whisper to every ear, there's time, there's time, there's time, there's time. And they have succeeded. You have heard the whisper and you have believed there is time. There is no time. None. None. Yesterday, the lady I was with, she told me of her friend who bought this jeep whatever i forgot what they call it she bought it she died she didn't enter for one day coronavirus took her out and she said another of her friend built a bought a house in lecky coronavirus took him out he didn't step in for one day he had plans she had plans she thought there was time there's no time the reason you believe there is time is because you are not on fire you are cold you are lukewarm. A man on fire. Would you, can you imagine you're on fire? And they'll say, the, there's no water in Lagos State. Then you say, okay, there's no water in Lagos State. It's not my fault I'm on fire. There's no water in Lagos State. Okay, let's put on the TV. Is that your attitude? When you're on fire, whether there's water, there's no water, you go and find water while you are desperate. Brethren, we are blind. They've lied to us this time. You think you live to 80? You don't have. You don't know James 4 says who thinks. You, God didn't guarantee tomorrow. Nobody knows when rapture will occur. Nobody knows when you will die. Your death is imminent. How do I know your death is coming soon? You can't live more than 100. So for the smallest baby in the house, add 100 to her. Is she up to one? The lady carrying um, daily. Is she up to one? Okay. So that's the smallest girl in this house. Add 100 to her years. Does she look to you like she live up to 100? The life expectancy, even in this Nigeria, is 40 something for men. 50 something for women 
within the time of Adam, it was 900 and something. By the time he got to Noah, 700 and something. By the time he got to Moses, who wrote Psalm 90, it was already 70 years. Life expectancy had dropped at Moses' time to 70. Now, Google life expectancy for men in Nigeria. It is 40 something. So, if you are above 40 in Nigeria, men, you have outlived your life expectancy. He's it it can't reach 100 years. For many of you, you have lived for more than your life and you have served God more than you have served Satan. You are 40, but 30 years used to serve Satan. You are 50, but 45 used to serve Satan. The remaining five years you have, make it count. You will regret not giving your all to Jesus. You will regret not giving your life to the Lord. You will regret it if you don't get up today. I want us to rise up and talk to God. Maybe you are lukewarm. That's why you think there is time when there is none. I say, Lord, tell yourself the truth. I have a reputation that I am alive, but I am dead. So, pray to God. Pray to God. I think um, uh, Precious, you are the one that sent me a message. She had a vision of the night. Said, come, 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 get me a mic. Even for I just remember it now. Give her a mic. Pass, pass, pass. Can somebody get her a mic? Where are the media people? Why use mine? Quickly, tell us what happened. on Friday night or so. I can't remember the day so I had the dream it was like I was in Shakara with Rev so she was talking to me and she said she made a statement she said the Lord the, she said my Lord Jesus is coming but the way she said it she made, she made it look like he was coming immediately like that's that very um, sec, um, minute so I asked her ma how do you why are you sounding like this I said ma why are you sounding like Jesus is coming now and immediately she ran to so we we're sitting on that chair then she ran to a corner and raised her hand with so much joy and she said my Lord Jesus has come and she said um, the Holy Spirit is here to make sure you're taken and then then it was like there was a screen like I could see the name of people that would be raptured and then I woke up and then when I woke up, there was this scripture that came in my mind. It said, blessed, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So then I now shared it with you. Yes, that scripture, that's what Pastor was saying. If your heart is impure, where is Onome? You had something like that too. Is she here? I saw somebody like that. Come, you had something like that. You saw two tables, a lot of people, one line very small, another line again. I don't know, Jesus has done more than enough. Come, come, give, 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 get, get her a mic. Blessed are the pure in heart. If your heart is full of crime, malice, anger, don't say next year. There is no time. He can come anytime. He can come anytime. Stop saying he's coming soon. He can come anytime. Use this if they are not ready. So I had a dream. In the dream, Pastor and Rev. Rev was on the left hand side. While Pastor was on the right hand side. Then there were a lot of familiar faces that I could tell in Oak House Church that were on Rev's lane. So we were, the Rev's queue was so long and I was either there or here. And I asked myself, I said, ah, when will my time, when will I get, when, when, when will it be my own time to get to the queue? More pastors on side, people were very few and I don't know them. There were very, very few. More people on the, the man that was standing with Rev was a very tall man and anytime they get to Rev's place, Rev would bring a stamp and stamp on the on the paper, then the man would tell them go to the other side, and I could see their faces. They were all crying. They were they were really really sad. But at pastors on side, they were really calm and they were happy. But they were really few. But I could see a lot of faces in Oak House Church. But when I woke up, I couldn't remember their faces again. You know the short one, the ones that were making heaven. They will stamp you go to heaven. You know the long one, those that were heading to hellfire. And we are here hearing the truth. So just imagine what is happening in the world. Where are you? Short list, long list of those. Oh, there was a day we had the night of heaven's night. A small girl had a vision. Jesus appeared and showed her two books. The small one contained people going to heaven. The big one contained people going to hell. Casual Christians are going to hell. Lukewarm Christians are not going to make it. Revelation chapter 2 is clear. They will not make it. There is only one type of Christian making heaven. It is red hot passion. Jesus will not accept anything because you are passionate about your career. Is him you will not be passionate about and then you want to make it. 
can we cry out to God today? Can we cry out to God and say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, help me, oh God, help me, help me, help me. If you want to lie on your face before God, this is the time to do that. Clear the chairs, lie on your face. This is the time. There is no time. There is no time. The altar is meant for Christians, not for unbelievers. It is a place of altar where God repairs your life. Where God repairs your life. Where God repairs your life. Paul, after everything, he said, Oh God, that I may win Christ. Jesus said, If you do not take up your cross, you are not worthy. He said, Those who that he invited for the banquet, they didn't come. Why didn't they come? The Bible said, The one went to the field. The other one went to his business and God made a comment. He said, They were not worthy. They were not worthy. But you know what? You can begin today and say, Lord, maybe I wasn't worthy before now. But God, help me make the correction that I needed. Make the correction that I needed. This is the time to fall on your face and say, Oh God, oh God, oh God. Some of us have a lot of wasted years. 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 If your master comes today, will you be ready? Will you be ready? Tell the Lord, revive me again, oh God. For I see that I am dry. Revive me again, oh God. There's a need for revival. There's a need. There's a need for revival. Being a virgin is not enough. You need extra oil. You need extra oil. You need extra oil. This world has come to warn somebody. This world has come to put somebody's life in order. It has come as a warning out of love. The same way Jesus came to warn the church. Not from a place of anger, but from a place of love. He came to warn the early church. He said, I see the way you are going. I love you too much to allow you to go that way. And that is why Jesus brought the warning. He brought the warning to the early church from a place of love. He said, I stand at the door. I am begging, let me in. I am begging, let me in. There is danger ahead. And it is soon. There is physical danger. The, Kadosha, the only way you can be preserved is inside Jesus. He's inside Jesus. He's bringing this warning as a sign of love. From a place of a heart of love. Because he sees the end from the beginning. Tell Lord, I surrender to you, O oh God. I surrender to you, O oh God. I surrender. Tell the Lord to change you. If there's malice, if there's bitterness, if there's anger, if there's pride, whatever it is. Tell him, take it away. Take it away, oh God. Take it away, oh God. Take it away, oh God. Spiritual laziness has to go. Spiritual laziness has to go. Christianity of excuse, it has to go. It has to go. No more excuse. Tell God, set my heart again on fire, oh God. Set this heart on fire. Set it on fire. Let me be radical again, oh God. Has God helped me today, oh God, help me. Whatever doesn't look like. Tell the Lord the fire of revival. That is still the fire of revival. If you tell the Holy Ghost to set your hearts on fire, He will. He is the spirit of revival. He is the spirit of revival. He comes to turn you back to the Father. He has come to reintroduce you back to the Father. He's come everything that you have lost. He has come to restore. Oh, what a friend we have. Jesus, his return is any time. His return is any time. James chapter 4 says you are not guaranteed of tomorrow. You are not guaranteed of doing that business tomorrow. You that you are saying next week. You that you are saying next year. You that you are saying I will repent next month. This is the time. If for any reason you are not born again, you are not saved, or you are not sure that if Jesus returns, you will go to heaven. If you are not sure that your name is in the book of life, I want you to join me in front very quickly. While the rest of us still pray. If you are like that, quickly come to the front so I can pray for you and lead you to Jesus. If you are not sure your name is in the book of life, from a place of love, Jesus has brought this warning. Come to the Lord and say, oh God, if you know the things that are there that do not look like Christ, tell God, remove it. Remove it, Lord. Remove it, Lord. I can't carry this thing on that day. I can't carry it on that day. Tell him to take it away. Take it away. Tell him to take it away. If you have not given your heart to Jesus, take this is the time. If your name is not in the book of life, this is the time. Join the lady in front. I can pray with you.
with you. Like you. Oh God, tell him take it away. Take it that away. is still yeah, reflecting in me. One of the things. One of the things. Tell him. Tell him. Tell him take it away. Oh God, that is magnifying yourself in me. Come forward. Take God. it away. Now I want you to pray. Take Tell the Lord away. to forgive you for what you have done wrong. Tell him, Lord, have mercy. Please Take forgive me. Please forgive me. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Tell him to wash you with the blood of Jesus. Tell him to cleanse you from every unrighteousness. Tell him to write your name in the book of life. Tell him to be your Lord and Master. Tell him to hold you by the hand and make this journey with you. Declare that you are saved by the blood of Jesus. I declare I am saved by the blood of Jesus. Oh, Father, we thank you for this one. Let the miracle of regeneration occur, oh God. And I ask that you help her, oh God. Set her heart on fire from day one. Set her heart on fire from day one. Let her be an instrument that will burn. Thank you, oh God. That she will not go back. Why don't you tell the Lord, set my heart on fire. Wherever you are in the house, say, Lord, I am lukewarm. I am casual. I am cold. Oh God, I can't continue like this. I can't continue like this. I can't continue. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. We wait. Set me on fire again. Remember where you are falling from. Remember where you are falling from. Ask for fresh fire. Ask for fresh fire. Ask for fresh fire. Tell him, Lord, I need fresh fire all my life. Tell him, I need fire. 